Oh, if everybody's second to settle in. Oh, this is such an exciting, this is really an exciting Grand Round. So welcome. My name's Mary Leonard. I'm chair of the department. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to Grand Rounds and a very special Grand Rounds today. As always, we'll start with our Stanford University land acknowledgement that we are on the ancestral land of the Muwek Maloney tribe. You can see here and then on the left, our usual codes and uh, housekeeping for uh, CME and MOC credit. Um, as you're going to hear in a moment, we're going to hear about reviving the unexpected victim of the pandemic, which is resident education, and then quite an amazing uh, few grand rounds to end the year. Understanding the legal landscape affecting transgender youth and its impact on patient care, I think this is front of mind for all of us. Um, and then I'm really looking forward uh, to hearing about how to survive the AI uprising, adapting amidst obsolescence. And something tells me she is updating her slides daily. It's a very exciting, uh, fast moving topic. This is such a fun time of year. Last year, we, or last week, we had the residence graduation event. Tonight, we're going to celebrate our fellows. And then on Friday, June 30th, we'll be having uh, awards day out on the lawn at CAM. It's a, quite a celebration. I don't know if we'll have the bubble machine out, but it is a, it is a special event. We're going to celebrate so many contributions from our faculty and our staff. So please, please uh, join us out on the lawn that Friday morning. Um, and then um, and then also just a reminder, after Grand Rounds ends this year, we will be back uh, in the fall, but we will be over at CAM because we are losing this auditorium to construction. We've sort of been losing it in slow motion with the noise that we've been experiencing recently, but we will be over in CAM and we will be on Tuesday. So that will be a bit of an experiment. So before I pass it off, to Carrie and to Ryan, I've been thinking a lot about this year and these chief residents. And the, so Carrie became program director in 2019. And she led this group, our chief residents have been with her through that entire process. And it gave me an opportunity to reflect a little bit on Carrie and Carrie's contributions. You became program director just before the pandemic. And I just want everyone to know the extraordinarily high regard with which all of the hospital leadership and all of the School of Medicine, of the very hard regard the School of Medicine leadership in which we hold carry for her extraordinary grace and her judgment and her ability throughout all of this as we navigated so many different challenges. She always thought about what was the very, very best thing for the house staff and for education, but also was able to think across the enterprise in a really balanced, in calm way, people constantly look to carry both, whether it's the CMO of the hospital or the folks, so, you know, the entire GME leadership at the school constantly wanted to know what Carrie's opinion was. This year, with extraordinary grace, she navigated the introduction of the X plus Y. Uh, she had to socialize that a little bit with some of our division chiefs and our clinic directors and help them understand why this was in the best interest of everyone. And then through all of it, and today is no exception, she has done extraordinary scholarship and education. It is so fun to go through and look at some of the, all the, the depth and the breadth of the topics, Carrie, that you've done really, really meaningful educational scholarship. Um, you know, I, it's so fun to go through and look at some of your papers on all sorts of topics, sense of belonging and professional identity, the clinical experience during the pandemic, the birth of the social mediatrician, Words matter, examining gender differences in the language used to evaluate pediatric residents. It's an incredible depth and breadth of really timely topics in education. And then the last thing that Carrie did with a lot of help from Michelle, I know Michelle's here somewhere, is bringing in grants to help fund the residency, whether it's uh, CalMed Force or the Song Brown Healthcare Workforce Training Program. So please join me in thanking Carrie for yet another wonderful year. All right. So Carrie, are you, you going to take us from here? All right. Thank you so much, Mary. Those are very kind remarks. And as many of you know, the chief residents play a very special role in my heart and our big part of our residency program. We could not run this residency program without our incredible chief residents. So it is my great pleasure to introduce you to our graduating chief residents who will be presenting this morning. Their power and contributions as chief residents comes both from their individual strengths as well as their collective contributions. So I'm going to introduce them all individually and I'll start with Dr. Liz Wen, who is a graduate of Northwestern University, where she graduated with a Bachelor of Arts in Economics, a minor in Business Institutions, and she completed a Leadership Certificate Program and an Honors Program in Medical Education. She then worked as a consultant 
um, business analyst through McKinsey here in Palo Alto for a couple of years before entering medical school also at Northwestern where she completed her MD. We were then very fortunate to recruit her into our pediatrics residency program here at Stanford, where she completed a medical education research project under the mentorship of Dr. Sarah Hilgenberg. And they looked at nationally what program directors thought pediatric residencies, residents should be acquiring in terms of procedural competency training skills. Um, her work influenced the new ACGME requirements, which are in draft form right now. Um, she presented her work nationally, and then she joined us as a chief resident, where she has demonstrated her passion for leadership and teaching through many ways, including residency council and other avenues. Next, I'll introduce Dr. Jennifer Sudler, who is a graduate of the University of Arizona at Tucson, where she graduated summa cum laude with a major in health sciences, an emphasis on honors physiology, and a minor in creative writing with an emphasis on poetry. I hope we get to hear some poetry soon. <laughs> She then completed her medical school also at the University of Arizona College of Medicine, where she had a distinction and commitment to underserved people track and in the medical education track. We then were very grateful to recruit her here to Stanford for her pediatrics residency. She also did a medical education research project with me, looking at um, delivering a framework for delivering difficult news to pediatric or uh, to children and their families, and taught our pe pediatric residents how to do that in the form of a randomized controlled trial. She then stepped into the role of chief resident, where she has been a strong leader who models excellence in clinical care teaching and innovation, including by leading our academic half days. Next, we have Dr. Ryan Leone here, who graduated from the University of Notre Dame. In case you don't know that, he's a big fan, a vocal fan. He majored in anthropology and pre-health and had a minor in poverty studies. He then completed a master's in global health at Duke University and then entered medical school at Georgetown, where he was in the health justice scholars track. We were then thrilled to bring him here to the Bay Area in Stanford, where he completed his pediatrics residency and did a global health project looking at improving morbidity and mortality for children with malignancies in Tanzania. He then stepped into the role of chief resident, where he has been a leader in our interprofessional collaborative council, the Grand Rounds Committee, and through the Association of Pediatric Program Directors, a chief resident's executive committee. Finally, I would like to introduce Dr. Sara Afsal, who's not able to be here this morning, but she was our fourth chief resident and she graduated from the University of California, Berkeley, Go Bears. And she had a major in molecular and cell biology with an emphasis on cell and developmental biology. She then worked for um, several years in research, including as a research coordinator looking at Rett syndrome at Children's Hospital Oakland. She then completed a master's in biomedical sciences, as well as her medical school at Chicago Medical School, Rosalind Franklin University of Medicine and Science. She initially completed her first two years of pediatric residency at uh, the University of Chicago, and we were really grateful that she transferred here for her third year and then joined us as a chief resident for her final year, um, where she served on the GME Chief Residence Council and brought her passion for clinical medicine, as well, well as for physicians with disabilities. Now, Sara um, is home with a sweet little baby girl and isn't able to be here, but she sends her best wishes to all of our graduating re residents and welcomes our new interns who are joining us on Monday. So together, our chief residents have been incredible models of outstanding clinical care, teaching, leadership, and, and uh, innovation. It is a great pleasure for me to introduce them to you so they can speak with you about their research called Reviving the Unexpected Victim of the Pandemic, Resident Education. Please join me in welcoming them. This is a true story. As told by one of the attendings from our institution in spring of 2022, two years into the COVID-19 pandemic. It was the middle of the night in the PICU and a patient was rolling in to be admitted, clearly in respiratory distress despite continuous albuterol. The second year resident went and took a thorough history, did an examination, and then I asked them, okay, what do you wanna try next? And they shyly admitted to me that they didn't know what to do next, and later said that this was actually the first severe asthma exacerbation that they had seen in residency. Now I knew that the COVID-19 pandemic had impacted the censuses of our pediatric wards and changed the population of the patients that the residents were seeing. But asthma exacerbations were one of the most commonly taught pediatric educational topics. 
So how did our, one of our residents make it almost two years into their residency without having this education? I felt like we had failed them. Resident education was the unexpected victim of the pandemic. Thank you all so much for joining us here today. We are so excited to see all of your faces. We want to make sure that you know that throughout this talk, when we use the vernacular educational conferences, what we're referring to are the morning reports and noon conferences that we hold on a daily basis. There are semi-protected formal didactic sessions for our residents that last about 30 to 60 minutes and are meant to supplement the clinical education that our residents are receiving. So go back with us to last academic year, the 2021-2022 academic year. And we realized at that point that our conferences are dying, despite valiant attempts at CPR. And like most real life resuscitations, things are not always going quite according to plan. So if we start back in November of 2021, at this point, our leadership had realized that something was wrong. There was poor attendance at conferences. They couldn't figure out why. They, re they really wanted to get the residents there. And they sent out this email. I'll read you some excerpts. Dear residents, minutes into the presentation, we only had four residents tune in. This was disheartening and, to be frank, embarrassing. We've seen a steady drop off in conferences over the last few months, and several conferences where less than five residents showed up, and that includes both Zoom and in person. So you would think that this email would be pretty impactful. Yeah. Um, that was November. December went by, and then now it's January, and we still see our then chief, Dr. John G. Barber, saying there's only four people on right now. Well, we all received this Slack message. And then in February, the terrifying event happened <laughs> where there was just one chief resident present for a noon conference given by our chair of pediatrics, Dr. Mary Leonard. Dr. Leonard, on behalf of all of us, <laughs> yikes, <laughs> please accept our sincerest apologies. And then comes March of 2022. Our then senior resident and now PICU fellow, Dr. Anna Brzezinski, had prepared a morning report only to show up and find that nobody was there. Second year resident Jorge Ortiz Colon stayed post call from his night shift so that she would have someone to present to. And it was so memorable that they took this picture. Again, chief residents, John G. Barber, sent out a Slack saying only one post call resident is here, but nobody came. And he was the lone audience member. April, May, June, the months trailed on and nothing changed. And it was unclear what the barrier was, what had happened to our educational conferences. At this point, we realized that the conferences were past the point of CPR. They needed to be cannulated onto educational ECMO. And so imagine us, we start our chief year in the end of June, beginning of July in 2022, and we're standing over our metaphorical ECMO patient and trying to think of what the plan is for what we're going to do next and how we're going to address this. And so we decide to draw on our years of excellent pediatric training, and we decide we need to take a thorough history and make a broad differential and really figure out what are the problems here that we need to address. So let's take a look back in history and see how we ended up in this place. <laughs> so we're going to take you back a few years to where Noon Conference was a place of togetherness, laughter, and eating lunch without masks. But then suddenly in March of 2020, the COVID-19 pandemic hit and everything changed with masking protocols, social distancing, and suddenly conferences had to be turned virtual. And we turned to this high-tech piece of technology we all came to know and love as Zoom. We had to learn lots of new things when we did this, including new phrases such as, um, I think you're muted. And I'm going to share my screen now. Uh, can everybody see what I'm sharing? <laughs> and as Zoom became an integral part of our education, the videos started being turned off and the participation began declining. Our inpatient residents were Zooming in from the workrooms, and this was incredibly distracting because they had their EMR in front of them, they were being pulled by patient tasks, they were talking to other members of the care team, and eventually they would just not be paying attention to noon conference at all. 
And for those who were rounding, they were no longer physically leaving to go to noon conference. And so it was easy for rounds to just continue through noon time and keep going throughout the day without any regard to what time it was or needing to stop for conference. This was also a challenge in the outpatient setting because while residents used to walk across the street to morning report and be there from 8 to 8.30 and then return to start seeing patients at 8.30, now residents were zooming into morning report from the clinic. And because they were there, they often just started seeing patients at 8. And so slowly it turned into residents start seeing patients at 8 a.m. and don't go to morning report at all. So even when things started returning, that habit had already been formed. Two years went by. Two new classes of residents that had never experienced consistent in-person conferences. And slowly but surely over that time, there was a culture shift and there was a change in everyone's habits. <clears throat> and now we were at a point where there was a new norm and prioritizing resident educational conferences was not a part of it. Okay, so now that we worked through what happened, <laughs> uh, we needed to identify if there was co tangible consequences or outcomes for our residents that we could measure. And here is what we found. So first of all, we looked at our ACGME survey data. Um, for those unfamiliar, we uh, give this ACGME survey to our residents every year and look at their different perspectives. And we found that within this survey, there was non-compliance with the response to residents feeling protected time to participate in structured learning activities, as well as appropriate balance between education and patient care. Um, the next thing we found was the board passage rates. So this was not just something here at this institution. This was a national problem. And, and what we saw was uh, across the country, board's passage rates in pediatrics fell. Um, so in 2018, before the pandemic, the passage rate was 90%. And then in 2022, this past year, that's fallen to 80%. And what's interesting is this is actually something very specific to pediatrics. Other specialties like internal medicine, gen surge, anesthesia are not seeing similar trends in falling. Um, and while our averages um, here at Stanford are above the national averages, we did also see uh, trends downward that mirrored this in both our board passage rates as well as our in-training exams, which we give to our residents uh, annually to kind of gauge general clinical knowledge. And then third, so during the pandemic, and Dr. Sedler highlighted this so beautifully earlier, you know, our adult censuses were, were skyrocketing. There are overflowing wards on the adult side, but on the pediatric sides, we were at an all-time low with respect to our censuses. And this meant missed learning opportunities. There was less opportunities to learn at bedside and gain that sort of clinical knowledge. And this was happening within the context of not having a strong conference culture to sort of offset uh, those missed learning opportunities. And so that brings us back to the start of our chief year. We knew something had to be done and we set off to try to improve resident education and identified three specific goals. So number one, our first goal was to improve conference attendance and engagement. Number two was to reverse this sort of um, cultural shift that we were seeing and to increase residents kind of perception of our overall conference culture as a whole. And then the third was to increase residents' fund of knowledge and clinical reasoning skills. We knew this wasn't going to be an easy process. We couldn't just change a conference. We had to change a culture. And in doing so, that would require multiple levels, all of our stakeholders and such. So with this sort of, now that we've outlined, you know, these problems that we are facing and these clear objectives, um, for the remainder of our presentation, we're really going to be showcasing the steps we took and the scholarly component of our work. So um, in trying to make large institutional change, we looked to the literature to find a framework that we felt could help guide us. And we landed on Cotter's eight-step process for change. So John Cotter um, wrote a book in the 1990s entitled Leading Change. He's former Harvard Business School faculty. And in this book, he outlined the challenges that institutions face in making changes, as well as giving these actionable eight-step items uh, to create change and build change. Um, so uh, here it is. Um, and initially described as a staircase, scholars uh, over the years have really determined that it's best viewed more as a cycle because it's such an change is such an iterative process. 
So we decided to draw upon this model from the business world and for creating change and apply it here to our own institution. And this here is the model we decided to use. And I'm going to walk you through it now uh, and break it down for you. So on the outside, you see the eight steps for change, um, which can be summarized um, broadly into the three buckets that you see in the middle. So the first, which you see in uh, blue, is create a climate for change. The second that you see in purple is to engage and enable. And the third is to implement and sustain. We're going to be going through all of our steps uh, over the remainder of our presentation, but just to broadly introduce them to you now, the first is to create a sense of urgency. The second is to build a guiding coalition. The third is to develop a strategic vision. The fourth is to share the vision. Five is to remove barriers. Six is to generate short-term wins. Seven is to sustain acceleration and eight is to embed changes into culture. So the first step, create a sense of urgency. Hopefully we've already done that for you now because we certainly felt that sense of urgency when we started our chief year. And our next step was to really communicate that sense of urgency with the same stories we shared with you today with our key stakeholders. And that brings us to step two, building a guiding coalition. So we started by trying to form our working team, really looking for advisors and mentors. And we wanna highlight some of those people here with you today and what their roles were. On the right, or on your left-hand side, you see Dr. Carrie Rossbach, our program director, and Dr. Kevin Quo, one of our associate program directors overseeing curriculum. These two were our mentors for our project. And really we couldn't have done everything that we did without their guidance. In the middle there, you see Dr. Victor Ritter, who is an extraordinary statistician who we had the honor of working with this year. He was so dedicated. He met with us weekly to discuss our progress on our project, to discuss the trends in our data that we were seeing that when we were collecting it, and to really help guide our methodology. Victor is on with us virtually today. Thank you so much for being here and truly for being with us every step of the way. Then you see Kat Jackman here, is who, who is one of our program coordinators, who is just really instrumental in helping us get our data. And then lastly, Dr. Aydin Zahedovich, right over there, who is one of our rising chief residents who we brought on as a resident liaison to really make sure that we were under, understanding our residents' perspectives correctly and the feedback that they were sharing with us. And he helped us brainstorm some ideas for intervention, interventions as well. After this, after we formed our working team, we went on to try to find faculty that could help champion our vision. And so we want to give a shout out now to the five faculty members outside of Cary who attended the most conferences for us this year. These people are Dr. Mel Balboni. <laughs> Many of them are in the audience with us today. So thank you to Dr. Mel Balboni, Dr. Debbie Sakai, Dr. Lauren Destino, Dr. Kiki Boyd, and Dr. Kate Sutter. <laughs> you all have role models for us continual learning and role models being there for our residents and you so deeply enriched the learning experience for them. So thank you. You already met Carrie and Kevin, but we also had the wonderful support of Dr. B Becky Blankenberg, the Assistant Dean of Graduate Medical Education, Dr. Alan Schroeder, who kindly helped to vol or volunteered to help us get our journal clubs off the ground again, and Dr. Mary Leonard, our chair of the department, who took the time to meet with us and truly advocate on our behalf. And we truly couldn't have done everything that we did this year and with this project without this team here, our program coordinators, Carrie Johnson, Michelle Brooks, Carrie McGoy, and Kat Jackman. The Times... <laughs> For the times that we couldn't be there for conferences, these four stepped in for us to make sure that our speakers were set up for success with all the AV tech equipment and that they felt comfortable. And we want to take a moment too to acknowledge everybody whose picture was not there, who was really instrumental in supporting us as individuals and as humans, who kept us sane throughout this process as we poured our heart and soul into this project, our blood, sweat, and tears. You all know who you are and thank you so, so much. Bringing it back to our model. So that was our guiding coalition. And now it was time for us to develop a strategic, uh, a strategic vision. 
And so when we did this, we knew that this needed to not just be about the interventions, but also how we collected data on the interventions. Did we know if they were working? Were they helping? What should we do next? We used a mixed method design that we will highlight for you here. So we decided to do a quantitative and qualitative survey feedback, as well as quantitative attendance data and data on our hospital that we collected on a daily basis in a year long iterative process. We drew on elements of the PDSA cycle. Um, we talked a lot about how much of a quality improvement stance to take here. And I think that we really had inspiration from the Plan Do Study Act, even though we were using Cotter's model um, kind of as our guiding, uh, as our the guiding principle that we were following. And so um, we use this a lot to decide uh, how conferences were going and figure out what we needed to implement and change. Over the year, we sent out a series of five surveys to the residents. And then after each, we met as a group, we analyzed the data, we reviewed what needed to be changed, and we decided what we should do to respond to resident feedback. Each of those five surveys consisted of the same 26 prompts. Some of them were a Likert scale that went from strongly disagree to strongly agree and assessed things like, did the residents find conference enjoyable? Was their time protected? Did they feel like they were getting prepared for boards? Did things like coffee or the presence of attendings there help influence them to be there? And then we also uh, had some open-ended qualitative questions like, what are your barriers from getting to conference? And what are the facilitating factors that make you wanna be there? Here is kind of a basic outline of the timeline that we created for ourselves when we were forming our strategic vision. Um, our pre-survey we first sent out in June of 2022 to get baseline data and see where we were at before we performed any interventions. And then we sent out four more approximately every two to three months after that. And the little green uh, lines just uh, highlight periods of time where we were looking at what those surveys showed us and then making changes based on what we saw. So in addition to the surveys, every single day we collected quantitative data based on resident attendance and what was happening in the hospital. And we thought it might be helpful to give you a little visual of what that looked like. Um, so it started with us uh, putting together hospital and conference data. We wrote down what the meeting type was, so whether it was hybrid or all in person, the, what the material type was going to be for the noon conference. So let's say it was going to be uh, lecture or case-based or we were playing Jeopardy. Not that kind of Jeopardy residents, don't worry. Um, we talked about whether there was going to be a candy or coffee present. And then we also checked the census of every inpatient team, as well as the census of the entire hospital. And then one other intervention that we'll talk more about later is we sent out volt reminders to our nurses, case managers, and also to our residents of the educational times for the day. So we marked when we had done that. So we did that every morning before a morning report, and then we did it again before noon conference. Then during each conference, one chief was assigned to take in-person and virtual attendance. Um, at first, we developed uh, NFC tags that contained resident data for each individual resident that they would badge in. So we either used the NFC tags or we used manual attendance to see who was there in person and who was virtual. And then in this data sheet, coding pulled in each attendee's data to calculate the in-person attendance broken down by class, those who attended who were med students, faculty, or other attendees, and then the total overall in person. We then repeated this process for virtual attendees, also then broken down by class, other attendees, total virtual attendees, and finally the total overall attendees. And then based off this data and ongoing analysis and continual reevaluation, we would adjust the specifics of what we were doing in order to bring us back to these three goals and make sure that we were addressing them. So now that we had designed our strategy and decided how we were going to do this, it was time for us to get buy-in from key stakeholders throughout the hospital at every level so that we could actually make change happen. And so that brings us to step four, which is sharing the vision. And all of you in this room are probably here because we wouldn't stop talking about this. <laughs> so thank you for listening to us. <laughs> we continue to talk to anyone who would listen about our vision. We met with the incredibly supportive Dr. Mary Leonard. We presented at the division chief meeting. We presented to members of the executive leadership team. We spoke with rotation directors. We spoke with nursing staff. We needed buy-in from our residents, particularly our senior residents who are leading our teams, getting them to conference and also giving morning reports. And then we needed support from the literal 
hundreds of people who signed up to teach at our morning reports and noon conferences. If you were one of the people who taught at those conferences, please know we are so grateful for you and for the support that you provided. All right, that brings us to step five, removing the barriers of which there were plenty. So as recent residents ourselves, when we undertook this project, we had already identified some barriers that we experienced as residents trying to attend conference. But we also wanted to ask our residents themselves in those surveys every two months, what were barriers that they were facing so we could try to address some of those. In the next few slides, I wanna highlight the top five things that we tried to address with you or the top five barriers that we tried to address in this project. So the first was quality. We knew that if we were going to ask our residents to come spend time with us in conference, we had to make it worth their while. That in their jam-packed days filled with clinical duties, that they would take the time to come to conference to learn and to be with their peers. So how did we do this? First is we had to make what we were teaching relevant to them. So we worked with Dr. Kevin Kuo to build out an 18 month curriculum for our noon conference series, allocating those conference slots to different general pediatric topics that were identified by the American Board of Pediatrics as topics that would be tested on the board's exam every year. And we adjusted those allocations based on what residents in our program might not be getting as much clinical exposure to and the areas on the in-training exam in the in-training exam that they might be scoring a little bit lower in. Second, we heard very loud and clear from our residents that the way they prefer to learn is case-based learning. So 100% of our morning reports were now case-based and many of our noon conferences have followed suit. We even are super intentional during our case-based discussions to carve out some time to make sure our residents have the opportunity to develop an assessment just like they would on the wards making sure that they are able to practice their clinical reasoning skills. Next is that we started to incorporate board review questions. So as you had heard already, on a national level, the pediatric board pass rates have gone down and locally we saw that too. So we thought we needed to start bringing in board prep from day one of residency. So we asked all of our speakers to include at least one board question, board prep question in their talk. This is one example from Dr. Andrew Brennan, one of our co-residents and now one of our cardiology fellows who gave a talk just earlier this week on telemetry review and he included this question here. We knew this was a major overhaul on how conferences had been done in the past. And so in order to help prep our speakers, we came up with this very lengthy and comprehensive email that you see here that includes all of those details to try to set them up for success to build some kind of interactive and engaging presentation for our residents. In this email here, you'll also see that we included a PowerPoint template that they can refer to to help structure their talk. All right, the next barrier that was identified was just patient load and often cited was busy clinics, high censuses, RSV surges, and long rounds. We want to take a moment to shout out Dr. Laura Keehan, who seems to be the common denominator <laughs> for the 100% clinic show rate, meaning that every patient that day showed up for their appointment. On the other hand, we don't feel like we have as much control over what happens in terms of how busy clinics are and how busy the hospital is, but we did try to do a couple of things to make it a little bit easier for our busy residents. We this year kept our, though we had a very strong emphasis on our in-person attendance, we did keep our, our conferences hybrid this year. So anybody who was offsite still had the virtual option to be able to attend conference should they want to participate in learning. The other thing that we did is 30 minutes before conference would start in the afternoon, one of us would take a lap around the, the units, just serving as a physical reminder to our teams especially the ones that were still rounding, that it was time to maybe take a break, wrap up what they were working on so that our residents could get to conference. On a similar vein, we also send out text reminders via Volt and via Slack, the platform that our residency program uses to communicate to all of our residents to just nudge them and remind them that conference would be starting soon and what the topic might be. All right, the next barrier that was identified was space. So as you might be able to see from this photo here, sometimes the conference room that we are using 
is a little bit of a tight squeeze for our large residency group. And as Dr. Mary Leonard had once mentioned earlier this year, sometimes conferences could be standing room only. Another space related topic that came up was that some residents thought our conference room, which is for those of you who haven't been, it's just down the hall here, seemed a little bit far. It was across the hospital from some of their patients and it was across the hospital from the cafeteria where food was. The last space related thing that came up that some of you might be aware of is that um, Stanford is growing and this part of the hospital is undergoing renovation. And with that comes the ever calming noise of drilling and hammering and the potential that Stanford might have other plans for the space that we were trying to make home again. So to address these space related barriers and threats, we did a few things. The first is that this year we tried to promote conference being from 12 to one for noon conference, but we didn't start conference until actually 1215 to allow residents the time to get food and then make their way over to the boardroom. The second thing we did is we brought back coffee, which seems simple, was it, but was actually a really large endeavor for us. <laughs> we hope that this, this removed at least one pit stop for some of our attendees in the morning and actually incentivized some people to, to make it to conference. Third, we talked to Lynn, um, <laughs> we, we talked to uh, Jill Sullivan, who was our senior vice president of st uh, strategic space planning. And uh, we discussed with her the importance of resident educational space. And she was kind enough to share with us the beautiful new plans and vision for the West building that is um, undergoing renovation right now. And also kindly shared with us that our conference room wasn't going anywhere. Along that veins related to construction, we met with Lynn Aguilera, who was so kind enough to be with us here today, who connected us with so many important people, including Steve Beju, the construction team, all of whom were so collaborative and worked with us to pause drilling underneath the boardroom during our educational time. So thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> They were also so kind that when the drilling would unexpectedly start up again and we had to make quick phone calls, they would help <laughs> us troubleshoot that. So thank you. All right. The fourth barrier that we addressed was protected time. So volt phones. These are our cell phones that our residents use to communicate with people when they're in the hospital. They're wonderful because they make it, they make it so easy for people to get in touch with you but they're also not wonderful because they make it so easy for people to get in touch with you. <laughs> and it's really hard sometimes to be present when your phone is just going off all the time. We know that at Stanford, the, the conference culture had really been lost over the past three years and we had a lot of re-education to do. So every day we would send a message similar to this one and broadcast it to all the nurses, the case managers, working on our acute care floors and in the intensive care unit. We would share with them when the educational time would be for that day. And we would ask them, if you have any urgent questions, please send them in the next 15 minutes. Otherwise, please hold it until conference is done for the morning or the afternoon. We've been so lucky that we've only been met with support and positive feedback from our nurses and our case managers. And truly, we are so appreciative of their partnership in making sure that we can prioritize our educational time. All right, last but not least, the fifth barrier we had to address was the number one commonly cited barrier, which is team awareness and support. What was interesting is that in the surveys that we sent out, we also asked not only what, was the, what were the barriers that you were facing, but what is the number one facilitator for you getting to conference as residents. And the answer, the number one answer to both barriers and facilitators was this, team awareness and support. Meaning that if attendings, fellows, and senior residents were aware of and encouraged conference attendance, then our residents would go. But if they were unaware of it, they disapproved of it, or they deprioritized it, our residents wouldn't necessarily go. And so what did we do? We've already told you, we've talked to everybody who would listen. We met with the division chiefs to share with them our vision and our initiatives. We met with our rotation directors. We also got our morning report series approved for CME. 
So we got it approved as a recurrent seminar series. So any faculty who would attend and participate would be able to claim CME. And Magna Patel, who is the manager of this, has been so instrumental and so diligent in making sure all of our speakers signed their disclosure forms so that our faculty could claim this CME every morning. And lastly, for those of you who might not be familiar, before I jump into this, I wanna share with you that our residence schedules are such that they rotate sites every two to four weeks. Sometimes they're here in the hospital, then they'll switch off service and go to the clinics. And so every time one of our senior residents would come back and work in the hospital here, we would send them an email, this one that you see here, that reminds them of their role in conference attendance for their team, since they're the clinical or they're, they're leading their clinical team, trying to equip them with a few tools that might make it a little bit easier for them to get buy-in from their team as well. As you can see, in trying to get from where we were to our dream state of where conference culture could be, we had to approach this from so many different ways. On this next slide here, you'll see all the different things, one more, all the different things that we, we just talked about that we implemented this year. Okay. So now heading into step six, generating short-term wins. And really in order to highlight what we were seeing and, and visualizing as our short-term wins, we really wanna now lean into the kind of objective results of our, uh, our data. So our attendance data, as well as our resident survey responses. So, because we feel like this really is, uh, highlights how we were making progress in terms of our goals. And just as a review, our goals were to improve conference attendance and engagement. Uh, two, re re improve residents' perceptions of our conference culture, and three, improve our residents' uh, fund of knowledge and clinical reasoning skills. So for this first, first goal of conference attendance and engagement, um, so here are some of our data. We were able to retroactively pull Zoom data from the prior academic year, and we're able to identify that we had a median attendance of about 15 via Zoom. As you can see here, there were even some, some weeks in which it was under 10. Um, then, as Dr. Sutherland described earlier, we meticulously collected that attendance data over the course of the academic year, and we're able to compare that. Um, and here's a visualization of what our attendance looked like following our interventions. Um, we ended up with a median attendance of about 31 following our interventions. Um, and through a Wilcoxon test, the difference in medians between the pre and the post met significant uh, statistical significance with a p-value of less than 0.001. Um, as you can see, and as we hypothesize, we anticipated a drop after the start of the year when you're through that honeymoon period of everyone being, being back together, but we felt we were able to sustain our attendance over the course of the academic year, including during our peak viral surge months of November through January. We are here being fully transparent with you. We also note there was that drop in April, which we have our, our theories and hypotheses behind, a little out of the scope for our presentation today. But as you can see, um, we, uh, our attendance in May has headed back up into our medians in our 30s. Numbers are only part of the story though. So we wanted to return back to some of the images that we shared with you at the beginning. The post or the pandemic learning environment with Zoom left so much to be desired with cameras off, low attendance, learners that were disengaged, distracted. And when we tried to return back to in-person attendance, you might remember we still had low attendance. Do you remember this picture here with just one, one post-call resident coming? Our boardroom this year looks and feels different. As you can see here, our, our attendance has increased. Not only the residents, but our fellows, our faculty, our medical students. We even have APPs that join us for learning sometimes. We have increased engagement, increased discussion, increased enthusiasm about learning from both the faculty or fellows or speakers who are presenting and those who are there learning. And we want to touch on the hidden curriculum of having a good conference culture too. We also feel like we've been building community and there's increased community. And we see this in those little moments where our residents are able to catch up before or after conference as they're walking back to the wards. One more picture. <laughs> so our residents not only rotate here, but they also rotate over at Santa Clara Valley Medical Center. 
we knew that in order to affect change at a throughout a residency program, we had to make change at all the major sites that our residents were rotating at. So though we did not collect official data for our, our conference interventions and the attendance at Santa Clara Valley, we did notice a, an, a huge increase in attendance at, as well. Conferences there were essentially non-existent. And here are some photos that you can see, just two examples of learning happening in morning report in the PICU conference room led by future chief resident, Dr. Faye Mendoza, and noon conference on the rooftop, getting some sunshine taught by who some of you might recognize, one of our former chiefs, Dr. Lee Trope. Okay, so going back now to our second goal of residents' perceptions of, um, uh, no. <laughs> uh, residents' perceptions of our conference culture here at Stanford, we're going to showcase um, some of our survey data response to our resident perspectives. Um, so um, uh, our first survey response question was uh, we, that we wish to highlight is that we have a good culture of conference attendance. Um, as a review, we looked at we each resident responded whether they strongly disagreed, disagreed, were neutral, agreed, or strongly agreed with each question. Um, in our pre-intervention survey, 87% um, of residents either strongly disagreed or disagree that we had a good conference culture attendance. Um, so um, we then, as a review, gave our subsequent iterations of our surveys and found significantly improved positive uh, perceptions over time. Uh, with 72% uh, agreeing or strongly agreeing in the last iteration of our survey. Um, and in a NOVA F test, comparing the mean between the pre and the post data, we found statistical significance with a p value of less than 0 0.001. Another measure that we think highlights progress in this space is the response to the survey question of our conference time feels protected from clinical obligations. Uh, prior to the intervention, we found that 81% of residents disagreed or strongly disagreed with this uh, statement. And only one resident said that they uh, agreed that they felt protected. <laughs> uh, but after our interventions, including what uh, Liz had, uh, Dr. Wynn had highlighted earlier, including our messages to nurses and such, we did see a uh, statistically significant improvement. With our last survey intervention in May, the 81% fell to um, uh, just 21% either strongly disagreeing or disagreeing, and then our 1% or 2% increase to 34% feeling protected. We recognize there's still work to do in this space, but we think this does highlight a significant improvement. Uh, stepping away for a second from our survey, this was not related to our survey, but this was the ACGME um, survey from this past year. And we just highlight this because we found it was consistent with what we're showing. So before the pandemic, uh, in spring 2020 to spring 2022, we saw 20% decline in the response to pro feeling protected time to participate in structured activities. And um, after just over the course of this past year, um, from 2022 to the 2023 ACGME survey, we found 20% improvement. So we're back to where we were before the pandemic. Uh, the last measure that we just want to highlight at this time from our resident surveys uh, was the response to um, the point of whether our conferences are preparing us for our pediatric board exams. We think this one's really important in the context of it demonstrates that residents are finding our conferences uh, helpful and productive and as well gets back into that other goal of just overall improving our residents fund of knowledge. Um, so as you saw before our intervention, only 36% of residents agreed that they felt our conferences were preparing them for our board exams. And then after um, this increased to 82% agreeing or strongly agreeing that we um, uh, had uh, 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 conferences that were preparing them for board exams. And this also met uh, statistical significance. Um, we also wanted to mention that we collected so much rich data for this year and still have a lot to learn from the data that we didn't show you here. And so with our amazing statistician, Dr. Victor Ritter's help, um, we plan to still look at comparing team and hospital censuses with attendance as a surrogate for a measure of whether being busy in the hospital affects your ability to come to conference. We also are going to use the attendance list to back extrapolate what rotation the residents were on at the time and see if there's particular rotations that are making it to conference less to see if there are any hotspots where we can uh, help with improvement. 
And then um, we also sent out a faculty survey recently. Thank you to all of those of you who participated. And we're excited to be able to go through and analyze those quantitative perspectives. But from a qualitative perspective, we did hear from faculty that they enjoy being a part of and teaching to the larger crowd of rooms and that residents seem more engaged than they were in the past. And then finally, we are excited to see the ITE scores um, in this August of 2023. Although we do recognize we won't be able to take all the credit if there is a, uh, a positive turn. <laughs> We wanted to take a moment and acknowledge that um, steps four through six were really that engage and able in iterative process. And now that we've made it through one through six, um, we, we really just kept going back and back and back and addressing those barriers. And we thought that that was going to be the hard part. But frankly, I think that now we're at the hard part in step seven, which is to sustain acceleration. In our analogy of reviving conferences on ECMO, we sort of feel like step seven is when you finally stabilized your patient. It's still tenuous, but things are not yet on autopilot. And we need to continue to address barriers to make improvements and continue to help others understand the importance of an educational curriculum that sustains resident knowledge regardless of census, regardless of surge or rotation. And so now that conferences are stable, we are ready to metaphorically decannulate, but we are holding our breath. All right. Last step, step eight, embedding change into culture. We know that with once we are able to embed this change into culture, we'll start to see longer term results like increased fund of knowledge, increased and improved clinical reasoning skills. This is our goal number three. Oops, sorry. Goal number three in terms of our original, original objectives when we first started off on this mission. We know that our residents have learned a lot this year. And we know this because one of us is present at probably 99% of the conferences that we've helped organize. And what we're doing there besides collecting all this data is also taking notes for our residents so that they can be fully present and just listen and learn. And we take these notes in this format that you see here and in this document that we've come to love called Clinical Pearls. It's essentially a living repository of all the teaching points that have been taught by our speakers that they wanna make sure our residents take away for the year. I think we looked back at it this week and in preparation for this, we saw that that document is 392 pages long and counting. And we hope that this resource is there for the residents for when they're in clinic, when they're on the wards, when they're like, oh, I think I remember learning this in morning report earlier, that they, they can use it and just do a con quick control F to find out what they had learned. We hope that it might even be something that they use when they're board studying. So we hope all of this knowledge, those 392 pages and counting translates to, to um, fund of knowledge as well. Oh, is it okay if we go back one slide? Um, so we hope that when our residents take our, their boards, that they feel like they've been prepared and that, that it translates to increased boards pass rate and to increased ITE scores this year, though we'll take some credit if it does go up. <laughs> Most importantly, though, we hope it translates to clinical care. So as chief residents, we have the opportunity to work in uh, urgent care and on the wards with our residents. And earlier this year when I was on service, Dr. Eliza Phillips had given a beautiful morning report on complicated community acquired pneumonia. And that same day, our medical students and residents brought what she taught about the management guidelines from the IDSA or their Infectious Disease Society for America of America to the bedside and proposed next steps in care for our patient. It's in moments like these when we see our residents taking what they learned from conference, using it in real time to further patient care that we know that our residents or what we're doing is making a difference and culture change has started. Now to our residents, we wanna take this moment to thank all of you. I think many of you are here, some back here. <laughs> Your enthusiasm and dedication have made it so easy for us to be passionate about this project. You show up, you own your, your own your education, and in the process, you teach us, and you make it so easy for us to be proud of you. Now, 
over the past two and a half years, it's, it's taken two and a half years for us to get to this point. And it's going to take time for culture to get back to where it was pre-pandemic and beyond. And it's bittersweet, but chief year is only a one-year role. And <laughs> in two... <laughs> In two short weeks, we're going to be passing the torch to these four incredible humans that you see here. We have Dr. Clayshi Bazy, Dr. Aydin Zahedevich, Dr. Faye Mendoza, and Dr. Aditi Reddy. They're going to be your next set of chief residents. But it's not just their responsibility to keep the momentum up. This is Stanford Children's Health Mission. Extraordinary care, continual learning, and breakthrough discoveries. As an academic center and a training site, it is all of our responsibilities to train the next generation of pediatric physicians. We are entrusting you with the education of our residents. <clears throat> Nurses and faculty, these residents are your colleagues, past, present, and future. Parents, these are the doctors that will be taking care of all of your children. In administration, your frontline providers are often the first impression that your patients have when they walk into our clinics and our hospitals. So it's important for all of us to take their education seriously. Actually, these are the residents with whose education we are entrusting you with. And these are the ones that will be joining you in just two short days. There's some of them in the back right now, the new interns. So we leave you with this. It took a village for us to get to where we are today. and. We hope we've demonstrated that with all the people it took to help us effectively make some of the changes that we discussed in our presentation. And it's up to this village now what happens next. What care, kind of care do you want your providers giving to our patients? What kind of education do you want your future fellows and coworkers to have? What is the type of doctor you want at bedside taking care of your child? I'm going to make a call back to one of the grand round speakers from earlier this year, we strongly believe that Stanford Pediatrics can train the best, the boldest, and the brightest. The post-resuscitation care of our conferences and our residents' education is now in all of your hands. Sorry for time. That was incredible, Chief. Thank you so much. We could not have resuscitated our conferences without the hard work of these chiefs who took a rigorous and robust approach to um, engaging all of our stakeholders, improving the quality of conferences, and so many other interventions. So I am grateful. This is a gift to me. It's a gift to our residents. It's a gift to our patients. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And one more round of applause. At the beginning of each year, our chiefs get to choose what they want to focus on. And the chiefs asked me for some thoughts on what, what the biggest need was. And I said, if there's any way you can fix conferences, that would be the biggest <laughs> gift to, to me and our institution. And they did it. So thank you. We do have a, a question in the chat, and then we'll take any live questions as well. And this is from one of our recent residency alumni. Um, Dr. Dayon, who asked, at other institutions, faculty members participate in morning report, noon conference, or both. Why don't we do that here? And how do you think that might impact the culture of resident education if we did? Uh, 
we would love to have our faculty fellows and attendings um, participate. That was part of our thought behind getting our morning report recognized as a recurring seminar series so that we could offer CME to faculty who attended, hoping that that would uh, be something that brought them in. When we do have our faculty attend and participate, it really does enrich the learning and enrich the conversation. And so we would love for that to be a part of the culture change. And then like Dr. Wynn mentioned in our surveys, the residents also talked about having that support from faculty uh, to go to conference was also really huge. Um, so we would love to have that be a continuous part of change in the future. Again, thank you to all the faculty who have participated and made it out to our conferences and taught, and we hope that that continues to be a way in the future. Our faculty may not realize how much our residents love you all, and so they want more time with you. Becky. Oh my goodness, this was incredible. You you four have taken such a rigorous approach to um, how we look at this problem. And I know nationally, this is a huge area of discussion. The American Board of Pediatrics, ACGME, PPD, we're all discussing this. You have demonstrated such incredible local solutions. Is there anything that can be done nationally? Um, or is this truly a local problem? Because I will say this is a national problem across institutions and other prestigious places also had a 4% attendance rate uh, recently. So. <laughs> we, we all have thoughts on this. We're all very excited about it. So I think the answer is it's both, right? I think a lot of this is an institutional problem, but I think, you know, as we are all sitting on our APPD committees and ACGME, and there are national bodies that can be really guiding residency programs and making sure that this remains a priority. I mean, I think it actually having those ACGME survey results um, from our national body and the ACGME putting pressure on us as an institution to respond to these comments actually gave us a lot of um, uh, it, it empowered us to really advocate for change. And I think that's the role that our national bodies can really have in kind of advocating for that. We also, we had a discussion at APPD with some of the other chief residents during a forum and talked about how this was an issue with everyone. And what we found very interesting is that everybody structures their conferences so differently and have different size programs and different resources that I think it would be tough to have like a one thing that really helped everyone. And I think it really does have to be individualized and customized for the programs. I think one novel thing we did was use this Cotter's eight step for change, which can be something that can be extrapolated to other programs. We're hoping to share our methodology so that other programs can learn from that and use those methods to figure out what are the driving factors that are preventing people or helping people get to their conferences so they can institute change. You're all going on a traveling speaking roadshow after this, right? Because <laughs> that was awesome. Thanks so much for doing this. You just mentioned that you were going to share some of your findings with other programs, which I absolutely think you should. Was there anything you learned from other programs throughout this process, other chiefs that just stood out with you and said, we should implement this? First of all, thank you, Dr. Alok Patel, uh, not only for that question, but for um, helping us through uh, two sessions that we attended on giving conferences and speaking and uh, helping to inspire us for this grand round. We appreciate your guidance. <laughs> it's not true. Um, but I, I, I don't know if you guys have thoughts on this, but I think that when we spoke to other places, one of the things that they did differently is they adjusted the time of the day that they had their conferences. And so we toyed a lot with kind of switching the timing and the number of days that we had conferences. So we did reduce the number of conferences per week that we had, hoping that um, giving people some like sunshine conferences or free times throughout the week helps to alleviate some of the burden of going to conference like every single day. So that is one of the things that we took from them. I don't know if there was anything else to you. Oh, the CME credit. Yeah, we, we took that from um, one of the other institutions as well, talked about how they offered CME credit. And we we're like, that's a great idea. Maybe we can figure that out. So thank you, Magna Patel. And I was going to say, building on that, one of the things we intentionally did not take from other institutions, and I, I, maybe we didn't highlight this as much because it was something that was really core to what we were doing, which is we didn't want to be penalizing our residents. They work so hard. We didn't want to be using shame or punishment as, as, as a sort of in, as incentive factor, which um, we had seen some other institutions try to emulate. Um, by like taking away funding for like step three or things like that. So we were inspired to stay away from those sorts of interventions. <laughs> <laughs> we, we hoped that if the educational conferences were interactive and they felt like they were learning, they would want to come. So we focused more on the content itself. 
I just wanted to echo everyone and thanking you guys for this amazing work. And I wanted to make sure that you're going to publish this because I think not only for residency education, but for just the idea of culture change. Like I think a lot of us have been struggling with that after COVID. And so it's so inspiring to see that it can actually be done and we can actually, I mean, I feel like the fel fellows should take this, faculty with their division meetings should take this. So thanks, nice work. Thank you so much. We have one more question in the chat from Dr. Cohen, Ron Cohen. Um, you started with residents not having seen asthma patients. What can we do about that problem and how to fix it? Conferences are not enough. I can really agree. I think that problem fixed itself this winter. <laughs> um, I know we saw a lot of lower sentences during the pandemic, but that is no longer the case um, as we were surging through this winter. And I think that our residents have now had uh, a lot of exposure to respiratory illnesses. And I think that's been remedied. Um, should we encounter something like this in the future, another pandemic? Obviously, this was our very first time as a program navigating this. And I think we would definitely be thoughtful about the rotations residents were on and what they were having exposure to. But hindsight's twenty twenty. I think that's something we will think about for the next uh, global pandemic. <laughs> Well, thank you all for coming and another huge round of applause for our amazing chief resident. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University. Please visit us at med.stanford.edu.